Hello and welcome to the Ask Abhijit Show, episode one seventy four. I hope you're all doing very well. I hope you're all doing great. Um, it's been almost three years since I've been doing this uh, this particular thing, Ask Abhijit, and I really appreciate you all watching. I really appreciate that. So let's see who all is there on the live chat today with us. I can see Aryan, Zin, Sub- Shubranshu. Ansh, Girish, Vag, Keshav, Vivek, Singh, Alpha, Tathagat, Tribhuvan, Anshul, Sinari, Me, Hir, Kulkarni, Mr. X, Gaming, SG, Kostob, Niranjan, Swami, Jain, Tejo, Meg, Divine Nature, Ishan, Mani, Tripathi, RSR Fighter, Matteo Perez, Geopolitical Dubey, hello, Illuminati Creek, Feminist Slayer, <laughs> Neo, Karan Nalavat, hello, Jashri Ram, LKR799, Jippy Phoenix, Tathagat, Karan, Akhil, Mujje, Swastik, Gaura, Niranjan, Bhardwaj, Threat Ripper, uh, Sunil, Sehgal, Ankur Singh, Vitrik, Martinez, Manan Thakur, Divine Nature, Knowledge Camp, Madhura, Class, Dhruv S, Deepak, Mato, Rambo, 6789, Shail, Shah, Arnav, Arnav Rai, Amisha, Mishra, Hello, Rajat, Dohan, Neo, Devanshu, Priyanshi, Sood, Aditya, Nitish, Harsh Pratap Singh, Junior, Journey, Shashi, Kiran, Pavan, Bhatt, Austin, Joseph, Hello, Priyansh, Ralla, Avinash, Universal, Pro, Shaitan Singh, CP, Verma, uh, and lots and lots and lots of other people, Ramita, Sinha, Assassin's Fox, Atish, Digpal, Karan, Karan Tilak, Sai Kumar, Akshit, Demon Slayer, Prasanna, Jang Thapa, and everybody else, I won't be able to, as usual, greet you all personally. But thank you so much for being on the live stream. And let's take some questions. What we talk about today entirely depends on you all. So let's let's get it get it get it going. Please ask me your questions, and I will take as many of them as possible over the over the next two or so hours. All right. So let's see. This is by Dia. Dia Namaskaram. Do you think all this racism on social media and mainstream news towards Indians is a propaganda that they're using for this upcoming election? Yeah, interesting question. If you go to social media today, if I, okay, if you go to Twitter or, or whatever, I'm not, I'm not sure about Instagram, but if you go to Twitter, where essentially the entire world congregates and has conversations, you will see a tremendous amount of racism right now these days towards Indians. And this is something that we have seen picking up over the past year and a half, maybe two years. It's increasing. The volume, intensity is, is is increasing. The amount of racism that you see towards Indians on a daily basis, the amount of racist tweets or posts, whatever you want to call them, the volume is increasing. Okay, And you've seen that from various parts of the world, typically from the Western world. Okay, And, there's, and whenever something bad happens in India, it's going to be amplified massively. Everyone talks about it. Look at what's wrong with India and so on. And when even worse things happen, as they do all over the world, no one talks about that. So it's like certain things are, uh, you know, you're going to highlight and certain things you will simply ignore, depending on where the, the crime or whatever occurs, right? So you're seeing this. And the question is, why is this happening? Why are we seeing this uptick, this significant massive uptick in racism and against Indians, against Hindus and this these anti-India posts, etc.? What is causing this? Why are we seeing so much of this in recent times? And there are a number of factors behind this. First of all, I'm sure that there still are lots of accounts on Twitter or X, what it's called these days, that are automated accounts, that are accounts created for propaganda purposes, what they call bots. I'm sure Elon Musk has done his best to eradicate as many bots as possible. But at the end of the day, this is a platform that's owned by the U.S., and uh, by the West, and they can do certain things, and you know, make make certain uh, certain impressions uh, happen. So one of the possibilities is that there is a concerted effort to malign India, and this is not something that's organic, but it's more more of a geopolitical thing. Okay, because India is rising. India is rising, the economic strength is rising, the technological advancement is rising. India has almost completely eradicated extreme poverty, not poverty, but extreme poverty, right? And that's not me, me that's saying it. It's the IMF and World Bank and all that that have put out the data, 
right so there is this this significant visible demonstrable rise of india india has become a, a significant geopolitical player in the in, in the asia pacific region in the indian ocean region right it's it's one of the like one could say the top 5 powers in the world today whether you believe it or not it is from the perspective of hard power so if you look at all of this india is rising and it is making lots lots of existing powers really uncomfortable so they are trying their best to you know uh, to to dampen the morale of the indian nation because morale is a thing morale creates momentum morale creates positivity morale gives you strength and power and stamina and all that the higher your morale is depending on how much you're winning and how much you're doing well the better you'll perform so one of the ways to dampen morale is to put out this barrage of anti india tweets and posts and things on social media so one of the components could be the geopolitical component that certain governments i mean if you remember edward snowden and his revelations about prism it was very clear that around 2010 about around that time the americans had a very clear grasp of what was happening on social media and they could manipulate social media to create to to create real world events and to make things happen they could trend whatever they wanted in a certain nation and india was one of the top nations from which they were extracting data okay so that was 2000 roughly 2010 this is almost 15 years ago so imagine the kind of capabilities they have today and the us is is uh, whether you like it or not whether you believe it or not is is it doesn't see india as as a friend there are no friends obviously in geopolitics but the us sees it, india as a long term competitor and possible threat not today but 20 years down the line but what happens 20 years down the line depends on what happens today so they uh, they obviously plan for the for the long term they plan for the future so that's one of the issues so one of the components could be geopolitical that they are creating this impression these these this kind of impression on social media and the other thing is that um, ordinary people in the west they also are not happy with the rise of india right and i mean racism is a thing every country has racism you i'm sure india also has racism right for for good reasons bad reasons right reasons wrong reasons doesn't matter but there is the, a certain amount of this in every nation and uh, we know the history of the west the past 500 years they have been winning they have been ruling the world even today we are living under the so called rules based world world order which the west the anglo saxons have created the, the anglo saxon world and when there is a new nation that rises up and a nation that they have failed to destroy we are not a nation we are a civilization we are a civilization state we are the oldest continuously existing civilization in the world we are the oldest civilization that still practices its own culture and worships its own gods and that is a from their perspective not a good thing it's a loss for them that they, they could not do to india what they did to greece what they did to rome what they did to let's say persia what they did to africa they devastated africa no, nobody in africa practices their own culture these days Uh, what they have largely succeeded in doing in in south korea to some extent in japan so they have failed to do that in india and so and, and so there are all these factors that are causing this this tremendous outpouring of racism uh, on social media and also uh, on mainstream news like uh, the i is saying you see a lot of these mainstream news stories you have all these indices happiness index democracy index yeah good fun uh so you have all that in which they i mean if you look at i the the so called alleged happiness index then india is lower than afghanistan pakistan and palestine in the happiness index that's how unhappy we indians are i mean what a joke so they do all this to dampen india's morale to make indians doubt themselves yeah and to create a certain impression of the world they want to maintain a certain uh, picking order in the world so all this mainstream media is essentially paid media it's all propaganda all media is to some extent propaganda okay all media has biases every individual has biases i have biases obviously i'm the first to say that i'm biased i am pro india i am biased towards india and everything i say is going to be colored with that bias i recognize that and i i i embrace that okay i am very strongly pro india so everybody has biases but the others are hypocritical hypocritical in 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 the sense that they claim that they are neutral no one's neutral the bbc is a neutral the cnn is a neutral fox is a neutral 
Twitter or X is a neutral. Facebook is a neutral. Nothing is neutral. So with social media platforms or mainstream media platforms and all that, even if you look at Indian mainstream media, every single channel or, or, or publication or platform, if you look at the kind of uh, coverage they do of various events, you will clearly see biases. Okay, And the biases, you can understand the root cause of the biases when you look at the funding. You know, where the money is coming in for each of these platforms. So that's how it goes. Okay. So this is a lot of this is propaganda, for sure, anti-India propaganda. There is this concerted effort to dampen the morale of Indians and make Indians feel that they're not good enough, they're inferior, and all that. And Indians already have this inferiority complex, lots of them. You know, compared to I mean, lots of Indians feel that that foreigners are better, that white people are superior somehow, that Indians have inferior genetics. I mean, look at the questions I get on this channel. Look at my old video clips and all that. So many of these questions I have fielded. So there is the genuine inferiority complex that, that is there among Indians. And so these all of this is, is, is just a means to amplify that and to perpetuate that. So what I would say is that disregard all this nonsense. Okay, be confident. We're going to win. <laughs> I'm not saying we're going to have to defeat everyone. We don't want to defeat anyone. Winning means you rise to the fullest extent of your potential. That's all. So that's how we're going to win. Okay, it's going to take time, but we're going to do it. And obviously, there's the elections that's going to come up. I mean, the election dates were declared today, I believe. Today. So obviously, there's going to be efforts to interfere in the electoral process. And the Americans are past masters at that. They have always been claiming that Russia has been interfering in their elections, but they are the ones who interfere everywhere. Okay, they've been uh, talking about CAA and all that. What business do they have talking about CAA? It's none of their business. It's an internal matter of India. One of the first principles of the global so-called rules-based world order is the principle of sovereignty and non-interference. -inter and they are the first nation to repeatedly disregard that rule selectively. So that's the deal. All right. Good question to start off with. Let's take more questions. Um, let us see what else do we have. Um, Akhil says, when will the media move out from India, Pakistan to India, China and politics, military wise, foreign policy, tactics, etc. I remember for the longest time on, on mainstream media, we had these so called strategic affairs experts. Today, they're all rebranded as geopolitics experts. Okay. Before the year 2021, nobody used the term geopolitics in India. So they were all strategic affairs experts. And for them, foreign policy meant Pakistan. International relations meant Pakistan. Some of the biggest news anchors in India, when the Prime Minister of India would go to the US, the some of these uh, media channels, I'm not naming anybody, by the way, okay? So some of these media channels would go to the US, okay? And uh, they would interview various experts in Washington, D.C. And the first question would be, but what about Pakistan? So it was the Indian media itself and the Indian experts themselves that were insistent on hyphenating India and Pakistan together. So that thankfully has kind of broken today. Today, the, the hyphenation is between India and China. The comparison that uh, is quite visible is between India and China. So that's a good move. Uh, Pakistan has become too insignificant. I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say Pakistan has become insin insin insignificant. Pakistan is hasn't changed. But India has changed. India has grown very rapidly and very significantly over the past decade. And today, there's no comparison between India and Pakistan. The Pakistanis understand that. We understand that. The world... Even the world has given up on trying to hyphenate India and Pakistan. Even the Americans have given up on that. Now the hyphenation is India-China. And please understand that India currently is way, way, way weaker than China. China, from the hard power perspective, is three to four times more powerful than India. Not just from the GDP perspective, from an overall hard power perspective. How do I come up with these figures, stats, figures, data, numbers? It's because uh, I have calculated the hard power scores of every single nation. And uh, if you want to learn how to do that, check out my geopolitics course. Link in the description. All right. Just a very quick plug. So I have calculated. And I'm going to put out the index. I'm going to put out this, this coming week the Chavda Index of Hard Power Global Rankings. I'm going to put it out. And so you, you're going to be able to see where each nation stands. And what you will see is going to be very surprising. It's going to surprise you. And more, many of you may not agree with that. Well, that's it. See, the thing is, we see power from a GDP perspective. Well, GDP isn't all there is to power. 
You may be the richest person in your city, but the smallest politician can come and take away all your, all your wealth. What matters is hard power in the context of city politics, street power. You may be the wealthiest person in your city, but if you don't have the street power, which politicians have, then there's nothing you can do if the politicians decide to take away your wealth. Okay? I'm talking about a hypothetical city, not any specific city, by the way. All right? So, so the thing is that India and China, if you compare them, China is about three to three and a half or maybe four times more powerful than India right now. But the situation is fluid and the situation is changing. So the hyphenation today is between India and China. So the media is slowly moving out of this Pakistan-centric mindset. The shift has already happened. And the Indian media typically takes the lead from the Western media, from the, um, from the Americans typically. So the Americans themselves have kind of now given up on hyphenating India and Pakistan because it makes no sense from, from any perspective, from any angle. Okay. So now the Indian media is also following their lead. So that's what's happening and that's a good thing. But what we need is we need proper China experts. I mean... Anybody can claim I'm a China expert. Anybody can claim I'm a strategic affairs expert or geopolitics expert. Now, the thing about Pakistan, Pakistan experts, is that we understand the language and the culture. The language and the culture is, is ours. The religion is, is a foreign religion. That's fine. But the language that the Pakistanis speak and the culture and the mindset and everything, we understand completely. We understand it thoroughly. Okay, So there can be lots of Pakistan experts in India. Just because it doesn't take too much of an effort to understand Pakistan. When it comes to China, to be a genuine China expert, you need to actually understand their language. You need to be able to speak the language and read the language and do research and, and research the, you know, the study, the research papers that they come up with and to understand what's really going on in their mind. So to be a genuine China expert, I mean, today anybody can claim any, claim any kind of expertise. Okay, But to be a genuine China expert, which I am not because I don't speak the language. You have to be able to speak the language, read the language, and study, do proper research of, of, the, of, of the content that is produced within China, maybe in social media, maybe in their mainstream media, official media, and, and more importantly, what the military uh, literature is, what the academic literature is. You need to be able, able to study that. And the advantage the Chinese have is that they aren't mentally colonized like Indians. They don't use English. To do research and to publish literature, academic literature. They use their own language, Mandarin Chinese. So to be a genuine China expert, you need to be able, you need to be fluent in Mandarin Chinese. Without, otherwise, you are not an expert. I will not consider you an expert. So I'm not an expert in China because I simply don't speak the language. I've never taken the time to study it. Probably I never will, but whatever. So that's what India needs. We need genuine domain experts, subject matter experts. And that's something we are lacking right now. But hopefully things change. Right. Mm. Gautam Varun says, how should our country promote Indian languages and make, make them the medium of instruction and replace English? It is something that I have advocated for a very long time, which is, and, and lots of people point out that Abhijit, you yourself speak in English. I know. Those people who pointed out, I, I, I would commend their powers of observation. Brilliant powers of observation. I really applaud that. The reason I use English today is because I want to, first of all, connect with everybody in India. Lots of people in India have never bothered to speak, learn Hindi. And I, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. Okay? And I want to reach out to everybody. And I want to reach out to, to the external world as well. Okay? Uh, whatever I am saying over here, whatever I, whatever content I create, I want the rest of the world also to understand it. Right now, whether we like it or not, the dominant language is English. So let's use the language of the colonizer to put our perspective forward. What needs to happen? It needs to happen through the government of India. Okay? And this, the moment the government of India tries to outlaw English, there's going to be a tremendous pushback from all the, you know, from all the, from, you know, where, from the usual suspects. They're going to push back. They're going to say that India, English is an Indian language. There can be no progress without English. There can be no science without English. There can be no technology without English. All that. There can be no progress without English. Well, China, how did they progress without English? They don't use English. Japan doesn't use English. Germany, is, Germany doesn't use English. France doesn't use English. But the the but that we are still far away from that. There's going to be a tremendous amount of pushback from our own mentally colonized people. And many of them are good people. They don't even understand. They don't realize how mentally colonized they are. There are lots of good people I know who believe that English is a strength that India has, that we speak English. I'm not saying they are wrong or they are bad. Of course, they are wrong, but 
but you know you need to have self respect and you need to why not make an indian language the dominant language in the world why not why is it impossible the the, the these these anglo saxons from a small island in the atlantic could do it they could make their language the dominant language in the world why can't a, a civilization of 1.4 1.5 billion people make their language the dominant language in the world so we have to think big the government has to take steps i think the government will not do it in the next 5 years also but one day a time will come when india is secure enough mentally and confident enough to take this forward it's going to take time it's going to it's going to require a change of mindset among the people see in in a democratic system like india the government only does what the people demand to not it any government would be stupid i would say to uh, to take to take actions that there are deeply unpopular among a large part of in of the of a subset of the of the population so it's going to take time but eventually when this when whatever happens it should be like you need to bring in an indian language you cannot have 17 indian languages what you can have is you can have one single civilization language and then so that could be the one medium of education and the second could be your mother tongue a two language system today we have a three or four language system english and hindi and your local state language three languages half the time you just studying languages what's the point so ideally you should have one or two languages at most and then if you want to learn other foreign languages it should be done on your own free time not on it should not be part of a curriculum so eventually the government needs to do that and i am very clear about this that the civilizational language national language has to be sanskrit and now once again lots of people will will be unha- unhappy with that well whether you like it or not the civilizational language has always been sanskrit and that needs to be revived so whenever that happens it will have to start at the lowest level from from nursery and it should take 20 years to go all the way up so each each year you add one level to it so first year you introduce that in in nursery the lowest level second you in second year you introduce in junior kg then senior kg then first standard second third standard and so on over over a time of one generation you can introduce it all across this system that's how that's that's a simple way of doing it obviously everything can be made as made to look as simple as you want to make it look obviously it's complicated but it's got to be done at some point in time if we want to truly rise as a civilizational entity or so it's for us to decide do we want to remain a nation state or do we want to embrace who we really are a civilization state right so there you have it so now here's a uh, an interesting question by prithvi matre why were indians so historically non martial people why don't we have Ch- indian chinggis khan napoleon and khalid ibn walid have you heard of samudra gupta samudra gupta was A, an emperor of the gupta dynasty about roughly 1500 years before today roughly give or take a couple of centuries if you are interested in knowing exactly when he lived and ruled google it okay i don't have dates uh, you know stuck in my mind so roughly 15 1600 years ago samudra gupta his entire career his entire career was an extended military campaign okay he unified the whole of india so that is and, and you had kumara gupta who who conquered bahlik what is called uh, today called balkh he kicked the arabs out of the region he defeated them what about uh, what about, okay then we have uh, the 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 karkota dynasty uh what's his name why why do names sometimes elude me uh who was the greatest king of the karkota dynasty can somebody remind me in the live chat come on live chat somebody remind me who's the king of the karkota dynasty karkota dynasty karkota muktipida yes dongar singh chauhan thank you so much i appreciate that lalit aditya muktipida mukti mukti muktipida so this guy he conquered central asia and your textbooks will not write about him they will not teach you about that your your teachers will probably they don't even know about him this guy conquered central asia large parts of central asia you would you do it through peace and non violence or would you need military conquest have you heard of the cholas have you heard of the cholas the cholas conquered southeast asia all the way to the philippines okay isn't that an example of being a martial race yes so and and who else do we have skanda gupta once again going back to the gupta era skanda gupta spent his entire life defending india from wave after wave of hunnic invasions the shweta hunas the 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 white huns 
they were invading they were attempting to invade india at the same time that they were succeeding in invading rome and destroying the roman empire that's how widespread the the and we yeah we haven't cracked open the map i mean what am i doing okay so let's crack open the map uh where's the map here's the map so let's understand what the the shweta hunas were doing the huns okay here we are so rome the roman empire was in europe obviously hmm? and we we are here in india the shweta hunas the white huns were attempting to invade india from the north at the same time as they were the same time that they were succeeding in destroying the roman empire in europe and skandagupta he took a vow he said that i will not sleep on a bed and i will not eat from a plate as long as i as i have not uh, you know ended this threat to my nation so he he decided he will only sleep on the ground and he will only eat from a leaf as long as the threat exists and he spent his entire life fighting and repelling repulsing the huns and he succeeded then what about the maratha empire i mean they reconquered and and uh, you know uh, they liberated india from the turks in the 18th century was that not um, an example of being a martial people so it's not about one race you know the british introduced this this disgusting concept of martial races that there are they they uh, they first of all put forth the notion that still exists in, among indian minds that india is a nation of multiple races of people you have the jats you have the rajputs you have the marathas and you have god knows what else the pashtuns and and uh, whatever you know I, yeah so and certain races among these people are martial races so the the british ascribed this term martial race to certain people and others were non martial races apparently and all of this is permeated through our education system and this has put all these notions in our head that indians are a nation of losers and we have never you know conquered other lands there is this very popular notion on social media that india hasn't invaded another country for in the past 2000 2000 3000 years what utter nonsense what utter nonsense so i mean i can give you so many more examples but please understand that if you study history then you will find that none of these things are true so obviously we do not have Chinggis Khan, obviously, we do not have, have that. Napoleon, you know what they call they, some idiots call Samudra Gupta the Napoleon of India. Samudra Gupta lived way before Napoleon. It should be Napoleon who is the Samudra Gupta of 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 Europe, uh, and so on. So we have had tremendous conquerors. We've had people who've conquered Central Asia multiple times. We have had uh, rulers who who conquered the whole of Southeast Asia. There was even a king in Manipur. what was his name khagenba or something who conquered yunnan china there have been kings of manipur who conquered burma who conquered mandalay and so on so there have been so many examples but we are not taught this the education te- system doesn't teach us this so that's why we keep on believing that we are a nation of losers we never did anything great and all we did was what whatever all right so please disabuse yourself of of these notions and the antidote to this is to read you know there's a thing about podcasts and all that you know you, you, <laughs> what i'm trying to say is that you cannot really learn deep knowledge from a podcast or from a show like this from a show like this the ask a budget show or from any podcast that you watch you may get inspiration you may get nuggets of 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 knowledge or wisdom but you will never get deep knowledge there is no substitute for deep reading okay so if you genuinely are interested in knowing about your own history read and then you will ask me where what do i read read everything give yourself a time of 5 or 10 years it's not something you can do over or 2 weeks right you can't do this over 2 weeks you got to invest time if you are genuinely serious about this give yourself a time of 5 to 10 years read everything you can find and much of it will be garbage i promise you that much of it will be garbage especially when it comes to indian history you will start with the wikipedia which is full of lies and you will look at other sources on the internet many of them could be completely wrong then you will re- read actual books many of these books when it comes to indian history are full of uh, misinformation and distortions but if you read enough then you will start to see patterns and you will start understanding where the distortions are but only if you read enough so it takes time okay but you got to do it all right good question and it's it's an important question to 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 take up all right um 
Oh, okay, funny clips. Funny clip says, which area, country, race, etc. has the best human genetics? Well, let me give you a, a bunch of statistics. You take any two random human beings, okay, from the surface of this planet that we live on, wherever geographically. Once again, let's let's pick up the map. Let's crack open the map. Where is the map? Here is the map. Okay, let me just spin the map and randomly point here. Okay, okay, I've pointed at which place? It is in South Africa. Okay, one person from South Africa, random person. And let's spin the map again, and I'll take it from here. Okay, it didn't didn't go anywhere. Once again, let me spin it again. And okay, now we're gonna have somebody from Quebec. So take a person from a random person from Quebec and take a random person from South Africa, and you do a DNA test, you, you decode their genome, and what you will find, what you will find, my friends, is that 99.9% .9 of the genome is gonna be identical. It's gonna be 0.1% or maybe less than that, that that will be different. Okay. So Essentially, we are this. We are almost the same, and obviously, there's gonna be the there's gonna be variations based on location, based on climate, based on how humans have had to adapt in various parts of the world. So, if you go to the northern latitudes in in northern hemisphere, what I'm talking about is Siberia and uh, Mongolia and these places, then you will find that there's a lot of very harsh sunlight that's reflected of the snows over there because it's always snowing there. The snow never really melts. And because of that, you need to really squint your eyes. So over thousands of years, humans developed the uh, mutation of having smaller eyes and, you know, thin eyes, I mean, slanted eyes, whatever you want to call it. Okay? And that's why you have people from the Mongolic regions and all, China, Mongolia, Japan, the higher latitudes. That you have, in, even in Northern America, the true natives of this region, they all have small eyes. You know, the... the uh, what do we call it? I don't remember what it's called. That uh, the technical term for it, uh, epicanthal folds or whatever they, they, it's called. So that. Then when it comes to people who live near the equator, because of the tremendously harsh sunlight that you get twenty-four. I mean, not twenty-four. 365 days a year, half the day. Because of that, people have developed higher amounts of melanin. Than melanin. That's why people have darker skin near the equator. As you go north, northwards or southwards, you have lighter skin. And then depending on the kind of terrain you have, whether it is hilly terrain or mountainous terrain or flat terrain, and how much nutrition you get, you had different kinds of, you know, uh, human phenotypes that have occurred. So each of these adaptations is perfect for that environment. So there is no such thing as superior genetics or, or inferior genetics. I mean, if you look at the adaptation in the adaptations in the jungles of, of Congo, you have people who are very short, the so-called pygmy people, right? They have adapted perfectly well for that environment. You ask a, a six foot tall person from northern India or southern India or any other place to live there for 20 years, that person may not be able to survive in that environment. So there's no such thing as best genetics, right? Genetics, wrong genetics, okay? It's not always true that if you are six feet, three inches tall, you are superior to somebody who's five feet seven. That's not the case. What really matters is what you do with your life, okay? And today, I mean, I mean, if you look at the Mongolian people, okay? Someone gave the example of Chinggis Khan, the great Shri Chinggis Khan, defender of peace. So someone gave the example of Chinggis Khan. If you look at the average Mongolian person, the, the average Mongolian person is not a tall person. Male, let's say male. I'm not sure what the average height in Mongolia is among males. Must be five, six, five, seven. I'm guessing. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. The Mongolians defeated the Russians repeatedly. They took over Russia. The average height of Russians, I would imagine, would be six feet or something. So how did a supposedly inferior race of people defeat a supposedly superior race of people? Europeans, that too. So understand, it's not about how what your what your what your superficial features are like. Uh, so that's the deal. So I don't believe any area, any country, any race has better genetics or any race has inferior genetics. It's all, it all matters on your conditions, your circumstances of life. I mean, if you look at Africa today, people get very little. There are lots of places in Africa where people get very less nutrition, which is going to impair their development, which means that they will not have the best physique and their mental development may be uh, impeded. And that's when pe people do these so-called IQ tests and they say that Africans have low IQ, whatever. What nonsense. It depends on so many more factors than what they are taking into account. 
So I believe there is no such thing as superior or inferior genetics. It all depends on what you do with your life and how, whether you succeed in rising to the fullest extent of your individual potential. And the nations that do that, they rule the world. All right. Okay, Dungar Singh Johan asks, where are the descendants of these great empires like the Mauryas, Guptas, etc.? So when it comes to the Maurya Empire, it emerged out of Magadha, Magad, which is present-day Bihar. Okay, present-day Bihar. And the capital of the Mauryas was Patliputra. Today it's called Patna. Okay, so Patna, today's Patna, historical Patliputra, was the capital of India at the time of the Maurya Samrajya, Maurya Empire, which was founded by Sri Chandragupta Maurya with the help of his great mentor, Sri Vishnugupta Chanakya. And uh, later you had an even greater emperor, which was Chandra, Sri Chandragupta Maurya's grandson, Sri Ashoka Maurya, one of India's greatest emperors, and who genuinely uh, unified the entire subcontinent. Ashoka spent his uh, youth as the as the governor of Gandhar, which is uh, Afghanistan, and so on. So, so the uh, capital of the Maurya era India was Patliputra. When it comes to the Gupta era India, Gupta Empire, once again it emerged out of Patliputra, out of out of uh, Magadh, present day Bihar, and then later they had their capital, I believe in where was it, Mathura was it or somewhere. I don't remember right now, but you can look it up. I'm sure you, you're able to Google that. So the great empires were made up of, I mean, whether it's the Maurya Empire or the Gupta Empire, both these empires encompassed the whole of the Indian subcontinent and oftentimes beyond that. For example, the Guptas, like I said, they conquered Bahlik, which is uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, that region. They, they, it was, I think it was Kumar Gupta who did that, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember right now, but you can always look it up and so on. So they, the, the soldiers, the, the generals, the administrators of these empires, you cannot run an, admin, an empire through one person, the emperor. Understand that. An empire isn't made up of one person, the emperor. An empire is an extensive arrangement. It needs an effective bureaucracy. It needs... Uh, system, an, ex, an effective system of administration that that is spread all across the geography of the of the of the empire. You need an education system. You need educators, high quality educators. You need merchants, artisans, craftspeople. You need soldiers, generals, infantry people. You need sailors. You understand? These empires may, were made up of our ancestors. All of them. Yeah, uh, if you were, we are asking about the descendants of the emperors, well, I'm not sure whether they, uh, we have lost the le the records of the lineages, right? The lo royal lineages. Uh, historically, I think there were 36 royal clans in India, right? The uh, aristocratic clans of India. I think what's his name, James Todd. I think it was the British guy who had uh, made a list of the 36 aristocratic uh, royal clans of india and these these lineages have been go, have been in existence since the late vedic era so the lineages go go all the way back to the vedic era kings today the monarchy system has been destroyed by the by the modern post 1947 government of india um, so that's that's how it is so we have lost many of the records of these lineages you know i'm sure we had entire records year by year and, and person after person of which king came succeeded whom which king preceded whom and so on king queen whatever but we've lost that so today i would imagine that many people in these parts of india would be descendants of some emperor or the other a little bit of ancestry would be there and some of them would be perhaps fortunate enough fortunate enough to know about it but many of them would not even know about it I'm sure lots of Indians are descended from Lord Ram. It's very much likely. Okay? Because Lord Ram would have lived several thousand years ago. And if you... I mean, think about it. You live today, you have two parents. You have four grandparents. You have eight great-grandparents. 
so that is over and and 16 great great grandparents and that is something that happens over a period of 100 years only four generations or five generations depending on whether it's 20 years or 25 years you go back a thousand years you have tens of thousands of ancestors you go back 3000 years just imagine how many ancestors you have essentially everybody who lived at that time would have contributed something to your genetics okay if you see it that way you will realize that all of us have some ancestry that, that goes back to the emperors and kings and queens who ruled ancient India. Going back to the times of Sri Krishna and Sri Ram, definitely. So if you think about that, that, that puts things in a certain perspective. We are all the descendants of these great kings and queens and emperors and empresses. All of us. We all have some genetic contribution from them. That is the answer. Okay, but Anisha says only Surya Vanshis would be descendants of Lord Ram, not Chandra Vanshis. Okay, so let's say, see, Lord Ram had two sons, right? Love and Kush. And uh, the cities of uh, Lahore and uh, Kasur, which are currently temporarily in Pakistan, are named after these two kings because they themselves are kings in their own right. And they would have had descendants. Now, their patrilineal descent would be Surya Vanshi, correct? Because Every time you have a son, that son is going to carry forward the lineage and that son is Suri Vanshi. But what if you have, obviously they would have some daughters as well, daughters, granddaughters, granddaughters and all. And those girls would go and marry among other clans, Chandra Vanshis and whatever other Vanshis. Yes. Which would mean that a Suri Vanshi king would also have Chandra Vanshi and other Vanshi descendants. Understand, Anisha ji? Okay. So... A lineage doesn't isn't a single line of descent. It's an entire network. It's an entire net of descendants. So the single patrilineal lineage of the successor kings would be the, would be the Suryavanshi lineage. I believe the Janjua Rajputs are are considered to be descendants of the of Lord Ram or whatever. That's what I've heard. But you would have so many other Vanshas that would also have genetic contributions from, from Lord Ram. Please understand it that in that manner. So, yeah, that's a deal. Okay. <laughs> Supriya says, can you explain the mystery of the missing flight MH370 of the Malaysian Airlines? Look, if I knew the, 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 the solution, the, the, the answer to the mystery, well, then... <laughs> See, the, the fact is no one knows. I'm sure there are people who know. I'm sure there are some people who know what happened. But I don't. So, look, it happened a long time ago and uh, the transponders on the aircraft were switched off, which means that those aircraft were only visible to military radars. That, that aircraft was only visible to military radars. Um, so when it comes to a military radar, it is, the military radars don't care whether a plane's transponder is switched on or off. They just ping, you know, they get the pings back from the physical frame of the aircraft. And that's all they look for. Uh, so, from a military radar's perspective, you cannot tell what aircraft it is, what its uh, serial number is and all that. You can only kind of judge the size of the aircraft, the altitude of the aircraft, and the speed and direction of the aircraft. So, this aircraft was visible on military radars, but it was invisible to commercial uh, radars for commercial aircraft. And it looks like it could have taken two arcs, two paths, after the transponder was switched off. One could have gone northwards into Central Asia. Another went, as we know, would have gone into the Indian Ocean. And uh, we don't quite know what happened. And it is believed that uh, it, it uh, essentially went all the way deep into the southern Indian Ocean. And maybe it crashed over there once it ran out of fuel. That's the belief. And uh, there have been accusations made against uh, Mr. Zahari, um, I forget the pilot's name, the captain's name, but uh, Zahari Ahmed or Muhammad or something, Malaysian uh, captain, he has been accused of uh, being the guy who did this, you know, pilot suicide, which is something that's not extremely uncommon, unfortunately. So it's happened in the past that some pilots wanted to commit suicide and they took the entire plane and the passengers with them. It happened in the uh, not very long ago German wings crash. And there have been there was an incident recently in China as well in which a plane just dove dove down straight down. It was, that was most likely a pilot suicide. So maybe this Zahari Ahmed thing was also a pilot suicide. That's the theory that's been put out. I'm not sure what 
the answer is hopefully someday we'll get to the bottom of this mystery as to what happened where is the whatever is left of the aircraft where is it located is it the, in the Indian Ocean somewhere else not sure but I, I, I don't have the answer sorry um Sanidhya Singh says, I am a Rajput. I am really interested in world history, but somehow I am unaware of the history of my own ancestors. Well, that's the story of all Indians. You know, the, the history we are taught is the history of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Greek, maybe Julius Caesar. Okay, great man, but complete genocidal maniac. Okay, by the way, Julius Caesar. We taught about, uh, I don't know, what other world history, and then we taught about the history of our oppressors and colonizers, which is the so-called Mughal Empire, which was in power for two and a half centuries, three centuries maximum. But we are made to believe that it's all of Indian history. And then we are taught, taught about the British colonizers of India and how they reformed India and made India better, apparently, allegedly, which is all a lie. But we are not taught of, of our own history. And that's why Indian kids find history so boring, because there is nothing that they can relate to. I mean, you're, we are being taught about Shah Jahan and Jahangir, all these Turkic barbarians. You're not taught of your own history. I mean, who are the Indian people? What is the origin of the Indian people? What journey have our ancestors taken? What hardships have our ancestors faced? What victories did our ancestors win? What wonderful things did our ancestors contribute to the world? And if I am, let's say, living in, in let's say, in, in uh, Telangana, or let's say I'm living in Assam, or um, let's say I'm living in, uh, let's say, Rajasthan, I would like to know the local history, what happened here in the past 2,000 years, 3,000 years. We're not taught any of that. So we simply can't relate to that. And that's why our kids have no interest in history. I myself went through this as a kid. All this, the you know, the lists of Mughal emperors and all that. But I, thankfully, my curiosity wasn't destroyed. I would read history books that were outside of the syllabus, and that's how I, I found. That's why that's why history was always interesting to me. So I totally understand, Sanidhya, what what uh, your situation is. We are not taught our history these days. There is a little bit that's taught about Maratha history, a little bit, maybe a page or two. But typically, the entire book is about. Is going to talk about the history of the British invaders and the Turkic invaders. Once again, when it comes to Rajput history, you're not even taught what is the origin of the Rajputs. That there are 36 royal clans, I mean, in India, and and so on. You're not taught anything. So obviously, you will not find history interesting. And what's the solution? I don't know. I mean, uh, ideally, the Indian government should publish the right kind of textbooks that teach actual Indian history, fact. Actual Indian history based on actual evidence, not opinions of various so-called eminent historians. In the absence of that, since, since that is not the case, since the those textbooks aren't there, I guess you will have to maybe look up, I don't know, R.C. Majumdar or those ancient historians who wrote a century ago, but those books are still reasonably okay. Uh, they have good information. And you can look up genetic data and all that, but that is very hard to interpret. So, yeah, I know that's a situation we all, all Indian kids go through today. You know, teenagers, children, young adults, old adults, everybody. You just don't know what to, what to make of your own history. Hopefully, over time, the situation improves. But I would say that uh, at least read world history. That's also interesting. Yeah. All right. Okay. What do we have? I don't even know what this is. So Jasneet Singh says, what's the story of Anunak, Anun, Anunanki? What are you wish? I've heard this term lots of times. Anunaki, I think they call it. I don't know what that is. It seems to be some mythological thing that came out of the Middle East. Um, the Hebrew culture or, or, or Mesopotamian culture or something. Some mythological supernatural beings of some kind. I don't know what that is. Okay. I, I mean, I've not studied that part of history. I'm not sure if it's even history. I think it's mythology. I mean, um, you know, beings with uh, supernatural powers and all that, that's obviously mythology. That's not, 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 not history. So that's what I know about it. And that's all I can say about it. Yeah. Tanuj Segal says, if Maldives decides to give China a proper military base, would India think to invade Maldives? Uh, so the Maldives, Maldives government has been, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Pazuzu is in power, right? Mr. Pazuzu, his name, or Muizu, Pazuzu, whatever his name is, Muizu, perhaps. 
So Mr. Muizu is the current uh, leader of the Maldives and he is very strongly anti-India and pro-China. Obviously, he's getting money from China. I promise you that. The Chinese are bribing him, filling his pockets and his coffers. And uh, he has recently acquired some drones from Turkey. Uh, what? By, by car drones or something. And he has uh, ordered the Indian uh, military to, to leave the country. And uh, yeah, he is very strongly pro-China. So the question is, what happens if the Maldives decides to give China a proper military base? I think it would be unacceptable to India. Obviously, the Maldives are currently a sovereign nation. Let's see how long, because eventually they'll be swallowed up by the sea if the sea level rises, which could happen. And then they will obviously want to gain shelter in India. We'll see about that when, when it comes to that. Uh, if the Chinese... Uh, acquire a base in the Maldives, I think it will cross several Indian red lines and maybe India will take some action. But I would not talk, want to talk about what action India would take. I don't want to, to talk about India invading nations. I don't think India would invade a nation unless it, it poses a direct threat to India's national interests. Uh, but there are lots of ways in which you could counter any such thing by China. I mean, you could essentially, you know, even though the Chinese may acquire, let's say hypothetically, a base in the Maldives, you could blockade the base navally, naval blockade, the Chinese could protest, well, let them protest, you know, and so on. So there are lots of, there's a whole graded uh, escalation ladder that exists that we can come up with uh, if if such a thing were to happen. But obviously it would be unacceptable, unacceptable to India for the, for the Chinese to have a military base in the Maldives. That is for sure. The Chinese already have a military base in the Cocoa Islands, uh, for example. So, so the Maldives are south of the Lakshadweep archipelago. They essentially are a continuation of the Lakshadweep archipelago. The British Indian Ocean Territory is also a continuation of the same archipelago. The Shago archipelago is a continuation of that. Of the Maldives, and the Maldives are a continuation of the Lakshadweep islands. So you have Maldives here, and then the Chinese already have a base, a military base, uh, in the northern Cocoa Island. Which one? Is it this? Uh, let's go to the... Uh, no, it's not this one. It's this one here. So this, these islands belong to India. The great, magnificent Sri Jawaharlal Nehruji gifted it to Burma, these two islands. And today you have a Chinese military base over here, which you can clearly see in the satellite images. Okay? It is nominally run by Burma, but it's actually operated by the Chinese. There's this observatory, and uh, there's this airstrip over here, and there are listening stations, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, there's a significant amount of infrastructure that the Chinese have built on this island. Do we have anything here? I'm not sure, but there would be some presence over here. As you can see, there's a road here. On the southern, on the little Cocoa Island. So there's something over here as well. So this is all thanks to the great, magnificent Sri Jawaharlal Nehruji. So the Chinese already have a presence here. Uh, the recently, when India conducted the Agni 5 test with MIRV technology, the Chinese had a couple of spy ships that were uh, tasked with uh, collecting electronic intelligence about the flight parameters of the missile and the, and the contents of the missile. So... Yeah, the Chinese would very much love to have some kind of asset over here, but that would not be acceptable to India. And let's see what India does about this, but I'm not sure that we would want to invade the Maldives, unless it becomes entirely uh, unavoidable. So yeah, that's a deal. Okay, let's take some, oh, some more questions. Some more questions. Okay, Om Sood says, how can we develop leadership qualities and become a civilizational political leader? A leader needs to have a tremendous range of abilities. So, what does it mean to be a leader? Do you have to be a, do you have to be six feet tall? Do you have to have a loud voice to be a leader? Do you have to be physically intimidating and scary to be a leader? Not really. What is leadership? Is the question. Well. Leadership, the simplest answer about leadership is that leadership is service. Leadership is service. 
but service in a way that you multiply with, with the force multiplier effect by bringing other people on board your mission and having them obey you for the larger interest of the of the of the people of the country yeah and obviously you need to know how to handle people you need to know how to face adversity you need to know how to handle criticism you need to know how to handle opponents adversaries there are so many things that you have to learn you have to learn how to organize people you have to have organizational skills you need to have all kinds of skills to be a political leader and to be a civilizational political leader you have to be grounded in your civilization as well so the thing about leadership is that leadership is service you cannot you will not be a genuine leader if you have a hidden agenda and if you have a conflict of interests that i'm serving the people but i'm also using it to to further my agenda and to and to somehow benefit me personally that should not be the case um so there's so much that that is part that goes into being a leader uh so understand so if you're just starting off and you want to be a leader if, i'm not sure you, initially you will not even know if you have those uh, if you are capable of being one now the thing is uh you need to be able to talk you need to be able to speak in public most people you put them in front of 20 people they'll be frightened to speak you put them put a person on a stage in front of 50 people that person is going to be frightened There's, most people will be trembling and listen that's not a bad thing i think it's a natural human reaction so what you have to do is to you have to embrace the fear you have to embrace the discomfort and learn how to thrive in such situations and all that that only comes through practice repeated practice uh so one thing one indispensable ability that every leader needs to every every great leader has is the ability to communicate verbally to connect with large numbers of people one to one the charisma all that so there's so much that goes into leadership but you i would say that you have to start by having the mindset of service that you want to serve leading means to serve i mean you know a person who cleans a street every day on his own volition or her own volition is serving the people and is in a very small way leading society in in that small that small locality the street you know but if you want to make the effect larger you have to take other people on board which means you have to inspire people to follow you so there's so much that goes into leadership maybe i should write a book about this or an article about this yeah uh, so yeah so start with the mindset of of service you want to serve society you want to serve the people oh right <clears throat> om bekerika says what was the main reason behind the disintegration of yugoslavia okay let's go to the map where is the map so yugoslavia is used to be east of italy today you have these nations here right the the balkan nations croatia serbia bosnia and herzegovina montenegro north macedonia slovenia all that all that was a single nation called yugoslavia uh, essentially a bunch of slavic peoples within a single nation and yugoslavia was well most people would say most historians would say was a satellite state of the ussr and it essentially existed and operated under the protection umbrella of the ussr it was a warsaw pact nation uh, the other nations were you know essentially poland and and, and so on hungary and all that uh, the eastern european nations Roman, romania as well so uh and then you also had another, another nation called czechoslovakia which is also broken up so after the disintegration of the ussr what happened is that this umbrella of protection disappeared and then obviously the americans the west because the americans had won the cold war so they had to bring it home to the people that we are now ruling we are now in charge and we're going to do what we think is right we're going to change things for you we're going to change things and your life will change your countries will change everything will change and since we are the winners we're going to decide and because of various factors such as these the nation of yugoslavia broke up so if you i mean you could do a two hour three hour lecture about the sequence of events and all that 
But if you ask me the main reason, the main reason behind the disintegration of Yugoslavia was that the, their their main protector and benefactor, the USSR itself, disintegrated in 1991, and then the Americans took control of the whole of Europe because Russia was very weak at the time. became It became very weak. Its economy collapsed. You had a ineffective ineffectual leader in Boris Yeltsin running the show, who was essentially a Western agent. So the Americans had the run of the whole of Europe at the time. And they decided to change things around. And then you had the, the entire Balkan conflict, the Kosovo, Serbia, all that stuff that happened in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, all that, you know. Sarajevo, Moshtar, if anyone remembers, uh, all that. So the main reason is, firstly, the collapse of the USSR, and secondly, the Americans deciding to change things in this region. Okay. Um, okay, what else do we have? Uh, Siddhan Singh says, should we worry about the Apophis asteroid? I'm not sure what the path of this asteroid is, what kind of orbit it has. I have not looked into it, but I am sure that there are a bunch of asteroids that are classified as near-Earth asteroids, which means that their orbit kind of coincides with the uh, orbit of the Earth, but not always at the same time. So the orbits may intersect, but so that means that over lots of orbits, you may have a close interaction between the Earth and so-and-so asteroid. Is Apophis one of them? May, I'm not sure, but if it is, in that case, we should keep a very close eye on that. And we should calculate its future orbits as far into the future as possible. The next, let's say, 10,000 orbits or whatever. I'm sure you can do it. It's not It's not a big deal. All you need is to use Newtonian mechanics and you can use computers to do that. You don't have to calculate the paths by hand. Uh, so I'm sure, that, I'm aware that there is a, a database of uh, near-Earth objects, uh, objects of particular concern that is constantly monitored and there are a few near misses in the future, in the, in the next 20, 30 years. I'm not sure if Apophis is one of those. The real danger is not from these known objects. The near, real danger is from unknown objects that we may have missed. Because the night sky is dark. These objects are bunch pieces of rock, essentially. You know, half a kilometer, one kilometer, five kilometer. And if you and the distances are enormous, millions of kilometers. It's almost impossible to see them. So you have these telescopes that keep on tracking these objects. And once in a while you come up with you, you see a new object, and then you start tracking that. So that's what you do. The danger is not from the objects that are, that are known and are, that are being tracked. The danger is from the objects that we have not discovered yet. Because those could be the ones that could possibly pose a threat. And uh, we know that in the in the past we've had these impact events, significant impact events. Uh, we had one about a decade ago, Chelyabinsk in in Russia in Siberia, which was not really a very uh, very significant event in the in in the in the sense that it didn't it did not kill anyone. It broke a lot of windows and all that. In 1908, you had the 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 Tunguska event which again happened in, in Siberia, and I don't think there were any casualties, but it was much more powerful than the Chelyabinsk event. Uh, but in the past, if you go back to a time frame of millions of years, we've had tremendously uh, life-changing events, like the Chukshilub impact that happened about 66 million years ago, which led to the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. And these events happen every maybe 60, 70, maybe 100 million years, this massive uh, extinction event uh, level impacts. So that obviously will happen in the future. It could happen next week. It could happen in the next 30 million years. We don't know. So we have to be ever vigilant. And uh, I'm sure there are government agencies, apart from the Americans, that are also keeping track of these objects. So yeah, we have to be cautious. We have to be always vigilant. All right. Uh, okay, what else do we have? Okay, this is by Assassin's Fox. Why wars weren't affecting ancient and medieval kingdoms but are affecting today's economy? Well, okay. Depends on, on the context. When it comes to wars in Europe, that did affect the economy because in, in so it, it all depends on how, how you fight war. When it came to India, 
pre invasion india i'm talking about the pre turkic invasions and pre british invasion pre so i'm talking about india before the past 1000 years okay so before in in the pre invasion india uh, wars were would typically happen over territorial disputes or some other dispute but the the wars would invade would involve the armies of the two opposing forces the two opposing powers let's say one kingdom in india fought another kingdom in india or whatever they would never devastate cities they would never touch civilians so that was the way indians fought war so when you don't destroy cities when you don't destroy crops when you don't destroy trade routes when you don't kill civilians it doesn't affect affect the economy okay to a large extent obviously an army which is on a campaign will need lots of food and sustenance to uh, to conduct its military campaign so that would have some effect on the economy but as long as there's no destruction of civilian areas there will be minimal impact on the economy so that's how indians used to fight wars obviously there were, there were wars between kingdoms and all that but they would never touch civilians that was the way indians fought war it all changed after the uh, arabic and turkic invasions in which civilians were fair targets and that is w- what started the decline of the indian economy so that's why the wars that happened within india in ancient india did not really affect the indian economy when it came comes to europe okay you had the 100 years war and you had all if you look at the the history of europe it's a history of wars like small wars big wars petty wars tribal wars just a constant history of wars these wars that the europeans fought they they would plunder uh civilian areas they would burn cities and towns and villages and they would kill civilians and enslave civilians and they would plunder the area they would burn crops you know, they would take away as much wealth as possible i mean you see that all the time and that is something that will obviously affect the economy okay so it depends on the context on the region on the country on the culture all that today when it comes to war i mean let's take the iraq war for example the american invasion of iraq 2003 what kind of uh, war was that it was a war of flattening an entire nation the americans went in full with war, what they call shock and awe and they flattened baghdad they flattened the creed they flattened uh, i don't know basra they flattened every city they came, came across simply smashed the living daylights out of out of the city and then they would not publish what happened uh, the aftermath they would only publish high level images not not what happened to the civilians obviously the civilians civilians ceased to exist as living entities right millions of them uh at least a million iraqis died so when you destroy an entire city an entire nation it's going to destroy the economy so it all depends on what kind of war you fight what is your method of fighting warfare if you use shock and oh if you flatten entire nations it's going to destroy the economy so it all depends on that right so if you are so, so that's the answer so it all depends on how you fight how you choose to fight war and obviously it it takes two to tango you want to fight a war that doesn't affect civilians but your enemy wants to destroy your entire nation and enslave all your people that's very two very different approaches so it takes two to tango so that is how wars affect or do not affect economies okay um is good question this yes gaming lover says why are indian cities so dirty and unhygienic even the holiest and sacred rivers are so polluted how can it be improved good question right is this because we indians have an inferior culture and we have inferior standards or is there some other reason behind this so the reason why the indian cities i'll i'm not specifying taking any specific city's name let's say a random hypothetical indian city why is it so dirty and unhygienic because the goddamn municipal corporation is corrupt okay they're not doing what they're supposed to do their job is to have a proper system of of uh, waste collection a proper system of maintenance they have such huge budgets there's no shortage of money but what happens where does the money go what is it allocated for what is it utilized for that's the question and you will say that why don't the people take care of this in india everybody struggles to earn a living india is a low income nation okay 
you have to travel two hours a day in a large city or four hours a day just to commute between your, your house and your place of work. And you're working four, five, six, seven days a week. You have no time or energy to go out and clean the, the roads. Okay? People are still in India, still, still, still struggling just, to, just for subsistence. India is not a high-income nation. When everyone is struggling just to maintain a very low standard of living and hopefully save some money and give the children a better future, do you think they will have the time to go and clean up the city and the streets and all that? Ah, the people don't have any standards. No. The system is such that they have trapped Indians in this, in this low-wage slavery system. Okay, Things are obviously changing, but I'm talking about the past 70, 80 years since independence, how things were. There was... There was nothing you could do about it. The entire system was corrupt. And if you refused to pay bribes or whatever, then you would go through hell. So people obviously will take the, the easy way out, pay a bribe and just ignore what's happening out there and do whatever you can for your family. So that, that's when people become close-minded and they start looking inwards and they just, you know, every, every person, every family for themselves. That's how it becomes. It's because of the corrupt system. I'm not talking about any specific city. Let me repeat this. Just hypothetical, any random city in the country. It's because there's a lot of money and all the money is used for God knows what. It is not used for what it should be used for. Okay. And then there are places where they'll say that you need to segregate uh, different kinds of waste. Okay. Dry waste and solid waste and whatnot and, and wet waste. Okay. So they'll they'll make you segregate your waste and 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 uh, and put it in different bins and all that. But at the end of the day, they are going to dump it all in the same landfill or the same river. And, and that's just the way it is, okay? The system has been built in such a way that it's just horrible. There's a long way to go for India to improve. And uh, this, entire, uh, um, this entire system of, of dumping you know, sewage into rivers, I think it was the British that started that. India, you know, India is a river valley civilization. Every single river is holy and sacred in India. Every river. And the British started the, started the practice of dumping raw sewage into rivers, including the Ganga, the Yamuna, the Kaveri, all the, all the great sacred holy rivers of India. And after 1947, the, the deracinated secular government of India expanded this practice to every single city in India. So you'll find that every single city in India, if I'm, I'm sure there must be some, hopefully, that they don't do it, but most cities in India simply dump sewage into either the rivers or into the ocean. So this is because of the low standards of the people who are running the country. I'm not talking about the, the guy at the top. He's trying to change things. I'm talking about the low-level, ground-level uh, administration of India. The people who actually run things on the ground. I'm sure there are some of them also who are good. Okay, I'm not saying everybody is bad. I'm not saying everybody is corrupt. But this is something that needs to be changed. There needs to be a war in India against corruption and, and low standards. Unfortunately, it's a top-down process. That, so it's, it's happening. It, it'll take maybe another 5, 10, 20 years for things to come all the way down to the ground level. But I am I'm optimistic. Because I know what what our standards used to be in the past. Okay? And that's something that's encoded in our DNA. If you, you know, you will see that Indians, when they go abroad, they are the most law-abiding people. They are the least likely to, to litter and make things dirty. But in India, we have no choice. So I would say stop blaming the victims. There are lots of people who will disagree, and I'm sure I will be able to see comments that I'm stupid and it is our own fault that this is happening. No, we are trapped in a system that we can't escape. We are simply trapped in the system. And that's why Indians have just given up over the past few generations. They've just given up. Chalne do. Chalta hai, chalne do. We'll just live our lives and do what we can and we'll escape and go abroad if we can. That's the deal. That's what it was. So we need to change the standards. We need to you know, eradicate corruption and malpractices. It's going to take time, but it will happen. Right. Um... Okay, 
<laughs> Prakar says, what's your opinion on election 24? Well, I don't know. I'm optimistic that Mr. Modi will win because I want Mr. Modi to win. Okay. If Mr. Modi Modi doesn't win, then it's 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 curtains for India. Curtains. Bool jao. So yes, uh, my opinion is that he will win. And I, I, I am very optimistic that he will win. And I would like him to win. Call me whatever you want. I am biased. Of course I am. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, Sarvagna Sharma says, is this current system of democracy good for Bharat? If not, what other system would be good for us? And what? And do you think it would? Be, it is good to continue in English as our official language? English should go. I said this about half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago, in this live stream itself, that English needs to go eventually. Right now, it's the dominant language in the world, but one day, we make our language the dominant language in the world. Why not? A small island in the Atlantic Ocean, a little bunch of people, they have, you know, through imperialism, imposed their language as the dominant language in the world, and they made Indians believe that it's the only way you can progress in the world. We need to uh, do something about that. Uh, so we need to do something about that. Uh, so English is, it is not good for English to continue as an official language in India. It's its a, the language of oppression, it's the language of colonialism. It's a foreign language and it has to go. Right now we will use it. Right now we will use the language of the oppressor to put forth our narrative, to put forth our ideas and our views, but eventually we have to bring in our language. Hopefully it happens within our lifetimes. Is the current system of democracy good for Bharat? Look, any, it, it, I don't care what system it is, as long as the nation progresses. So if the current system of democracy can do that, great. See, in the 21st century, the nations that will rule the world, lead the world, are the nations that will make the most advances, the most rapid advances in technology, and also the nations that will make the quickest decisions and implement those decisions as fast as possible. So you can have a leader who has the best ideas, but if the system is so corrupt and so rotten that it cannot implement the decisions of the, of, the, of the leader or the government, then that system is bad. And currently, as we know very well, the Indian system needs a significant overhaul. I'm not saying democracy is, is bad or good. I'm saying the system that we have, this entirely cumbersome uh, and, and very ancient, outdated, obsolete bureaucratic system that we have, the rotten education system, all that needs to change. Okay? Democracy, there's nothing wrong with democracy. Democracy was born in India, but we had our own form of democracy, which did not involve going, that the leader of the country has to go to the, to for, has to stand for elections every five years or whatever. It was a different system. India had a, India had a hybrid system. So you would have an emperor at the top, Chandragupta Maurya, Kanishka the Kushan, or um, Skanda Gupta, Kumara Gupta, Samudra Gupta, or, or, or uh, Lalita Ditya Muktapida, or the Cholas, or whoever, you would have an emperor at the top, and then you would have democracy at the grassroots, which mean the, means the people would elect their own officials at the grassroots, who would handle things locally. Right now, it's a very different system. So that was the system which we had in India, and if you look at the various times in, 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 in history, in world history, when India has been a supreme power, very powerful nation, great economy and all that, it's always been when India was ruled by a dictator, an emperor. So, yeah, there we go. That's what I can say about this. Giuseppe Di Fraia says, Why is pleased divorce among men and women increasing to shocking levels in marriages? Thanks. Look, it's because in the West, this is a Western thing. In the West, it is believed that the individual hmm, that the individual is the uh, unit of society. So it's all about individualism. This is a very Anglo-Saxon thing. You will see this attitude among the Anglo-Saxons and the Germans. Germany obviously is a defeated nation. It's a colonized nation. It's an occupied nation. So they don't matter anymore, the Germans. But it's the Anglo-Saxons who rule the world, the five eyes. And who rules the five eyes? The US. It's a very Anglo-Saxon thing, this individualism. So according to them, the individual is the unit of society. In other parts of the world, in other civilizations, in civilized places, the family is the unit of society, not the individual. 
So when you place self above everything else, and then when you have these ideas like the woke ideology, the woke mind virus that's prevalent in the West today, and all that, and when you when and then when you take away culture and religion out of the out of the mix of society, then you are left with no values, no moral foundation by which, no moral framework by which to live life. So then people will go and cheat, people will go and, you know, have uh, extramarital affairs, or the, you would never get married, you have children out of marriage and all that. That, com that leads to a complete breakdown of society. And then the lowest values become the most common values. And that's what you're seeing in the West. I mean, the kind of images you see in social media, videos and all, that come out of the West, which now constitutes US culture, uh, it makes me want to cringe. So it's because of this that there is such a high rate of divorce among men and women. It used to be what in, in Christianity, until death do us part. That's what they used to say, the vows, the marriage vows in Christianity. Today it's until divorce does us, does us part, which is typically six months to two years. And then you get a new partner. Then you get a new partner. Or you don't get married and have 78 different partners over a period of three months or whatever. It's 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 crazy. It, it reduces you down to the level of almost animals, I would say. You need to have standards in everything. And I, I believe that monogamy is a, is, a, is a high standard to have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so because of the, this breakdown of values, breakdown of culture, the the complete removal of any religion from society. Obviously, it's Christianity that's been removed from Western society. Christianity itself was, an, was a forcible imposition on Western society. But that's beside the point. You need some kind of moral found framework, whatever it is, good, bad, inferior, superior, at least some kind of find framework is there. If you have that, then you know how to, then you don't have to think about how to live life. You just know that this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. And today it's all about my, my free will, my choice. I decide what I do with life. I will, everybody does drugs, everybody does uh, promiscuous sex. It's, it's crazy. And that's why you have this high rate of divorce among men and women. And you know, the, the bad effects of that is that every child comes from a broken family. And children who come from a broken family are way more likely to do drugs, to, to be abusive in relationships, to commit suicide, to go to prison, to commit crime, all that. It's statistically, you know, there have been so many studies that, that bear this out. So what you're seeing is a, is a devolution, devolution of society, of societal standards in the West. And now they're trying to export it to the rest of the world. Uh, so yeah, that's the situation. And that's why you have all these, all these, uh, problems that have crept into, that are creeping into Western society and they're trying to export it worldwide. I hope they fail. Okay. Tepfusao Sachu says, please tell us about the FMR in the Northeastern region with, uh, with focus on Nagaland. What's FMR, I wonder? FMR. Not sure what FMR is. Let me just try and Google what FMR is. FMR full form... Free movement regime, free movement regime, free movement regime. All right, I get it, I get it. So, what's this free movement regime in the northeastern region of India, the far east of India? Look, okay, let's go to the map. We have the map here, okay. Let's go back to India, to Bharat. Now, you know, why is this region, this particular region of India called the northeast? I'll tell you why it's called the northeast. The British invaders and occupiers of India initially were based out of what is today called Bengal. Okay, And from their location in Bengal, this region was to their northeast from where they were situated. So they used to call this region the northeast. Later on, the British ruled all over all of India. But India's stupid, idiotic historians kept on repeating the old British terminology. And they kept on calling this region the Northeast. It's actually the far east of India. From what perspective is it in the north and east of India? It's the far east of India. It's the easternmost extremity of India. So it's not the Northeast. It's these idiot historians, the so-called eminent historians of India, who have kept on perpetuating this outdated narrative from a British perspective. Okay, now, the question is, the free movement regime, 
the free movement regime was this uh, agree was this understanding we had with uh, the government of burma that we would not fence the border see burma is a friendly nation okay burma is uh, culturally historically very aligned with india uh, uh, so and, and it's a friendly nation I mean, we have had never well never any real disputes with burma of any kind or any significant kind since 1947 since the since the 20th century essentially <clears throat> so we've had uh, we've had this open border policy and uh, the movement of people was allowed across the border i mean you could, people from burma could just walk into india and stay for a certain number of days and people from the indian side of the border could walk into burma and stay for a specific number of days this was called the, this is still called the free movement regime in this region and this applies to all the border states which is arunachal pradesh nagaland manipur and mizoram okay vis-a-vis -vis burma the international border with burma myanmar so that's the free movement regime and now we're going to end that because of the situation because you know millions not millions but hundreds of thousands of burmese uh, of 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 uh, individuals from burma have moved into essentially into manipur okay and they have occupied a significant portion of manipur maybe more than 50% of manipur if you look at satellite images of the over the past 5 7 years you will see thousands of new villages that have crept up that have come up and it is alleged that many of them are coming through mizoram so they enter through mizoram allegedly and they are not allowed to settle down in mizoram but they are allowed to go northwards into manipur allegedly where they settle down permanently and that has completely transformed the demographics of this region artificially which is unacceptable and all the foreigners need to go and this stupid indian government of the 20th century various governments in the 1960s 70s etc they had this policy of settling these so called kuki uh refugees into in, into into manipur for what reason i have no idea obviously they just wanted to change the re religious and ethnic demographics of the region so because of the situation today which has been inherited by the current government but it has not been created by the current government because of that now india has decided to end the free movement regime and uh, some some states apparently i hear allegedly are protesting against that i hear that allegedly mizoram is allegedly protesting against the ending of the free movement regime they want to keep the border open for god knows what reason but it is not their call they don't get to decide a state doesn't get to decide what happens at the international border of india and that's just the way it's going to be mizoram is going it's another issue that needs to be resolved it will be resolved properly okay it will take time but it will be resolved i will not go into mizoram right now a very interesting case study actually so and and nagaland also so obviously the people who are called the nagas the various tribes so many of them really live on the other side of the border and historically they have had you know they have been the same people so obviously i i would expect that there would be some some possible perhaps resistance from nagaland also but look when it comes to national security we got to put the nation nation first so the free movement regime will end now it's going to take many years to fence the border properly and to have the kind of patrolling that we have on the western border with the temporary nation called pakistan but it will be done so the when it comes to nagaland the folk, so the question is focus on nagaland so look nagaland is this region north of manipur which is made up of a large number of different tribes who all speak different languages historically uh, they many of them uh, lived possibly in a significant amount of isolation for centuries that sort of thing and uh, this border i mean if you go east of the international border you will have the same many of the same ethnic groups who live in northern burma who would be called nagas right uh, according to the terminology uh, so obviously the same situation occurs in nagaland that people would uh, travel across the border which is a good thing and a bad thing because you know not very far from nagaland if you cross northern burma you come to china which is hardly uh, let's see let's try and calculate the distance here yeah? if you calculate the distance is about 300 kilometers which is not a very significant amount of territory so if you have free movement then it is known that uh, you know various insurgent groups separatist groups which have uh, been fighting the government of india for decades in this region have been supplied arms from china and obviously this comes across the border right so 
at some point in time, the government of India has to take the call as to what is in the best interest of the nation. Uh, once the government of Burma can properly take control of the whole of the country, then we could possibly rethink this. But right now, we definitely need an end to the free movement regime so that we can, you know, safeguard the territorial interests of India and, and stop this ridiculous influx of cookie refugees into India and then they acquire documentation and they become Indian. So there's going to be NRC, all that which will be done and the foreigners will be evicted because we need justice for the true Indi for the true Indi Indians, the true natives of, of India. Uh, India is not some kind of uh, dharamshala like they say, that anybody can come and just settle down, squat in Indian territory and start demanding rights. Uh, so yeah, this problem will be solved, but it's going to take time. Minimum, I would say, 20 years. It's a this problem was created over more than a century's time. Okay, by the British and by then by the post-colonial government of India, post-47 governments of India, including the government of the great Sri Jawaharlal Nehru. So this problem was created then, and this the current government has inherited this problem, and they are trying to solve it. it it's going to take time. The people of the region need to understand that you need patience. You need to be patient. You're going to have to swallow a lot of pain for the next 10, 20 years. But yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure this, this problem will be solved by evicting the foreigners from Indian territory. Chandana Mandal says, I'm a supporter of, of Aryans from this land, all right? But there's this word called Adivasi. That means someone who is from this land since, since the start. Doesn't that explain that Aryans were foreign? When, okay, good question. The question is this, Chandanaji. This term Adivasi, when was this term coined? When was this term created? Do you find this term in ancient Indian literature from, let's say, 500 AD? You don't. Do you find this term in Indian literature from, from 1500 AD? You don't. You don't. Do you find this term, this term Adivasi, in Vedic literature, in late Vedic literature, in post-Vedic literature, in Pali literature, in Kannada literature, in Prakrit literature, you find it nowhere. This is a neologism, a term that was created recently, like in the past hundred or so years. Okay? And this term was created to divide Indians into natives and foreigners. So, the question that, that, you, that you're asking is pretty logical. Good question. So, the, to answer the question, all you have to do is take this term Adivasi and trace its origin. When does it first appear in literature? And you will find that it appears in colonial and post-colonial literature only. So, it was a term that was recently created with the objective of, of creating artificial divisions within Indians. And they have, then they will say that certain people are Adivasis and others are not Adivasis. And this is new new term that has come up these days, Mool Nivasi. Who gets to decide who is Mool Nivasi and who is Adivasi? Who gets to decide these? Hmm? These so-called professors who actually do no actual research? So that's the thing. And if you do genetic analysis of people of India, you will find that the genetics of the uh, are essentially uniform across India. Whether it is the so-called Adivasis or the so-called Mulnivasis or the so-called Dravidians or the so-called Aryans, they all have the same genetics. So then what? Yeah. So what they do is that they want to influence people by creating terms. Terms that that and because it comes from academia, it looks very genuine. So you start believing, yeah, Adivasi means those, those people must be the original people. And we, our ancestors must be, our ancestors must be what? Invaders, occupiers. And since our ancestors were invaders and occupiers, who brought along Sanskrit and Hinduism, that means even Hinduism and Sanskrit is foreign to India. So then it's okay for other foreign religions to also come into India and, and evict Hinduism and destroy Hinduism. That is the objective. All right? So uh, creating a new term doesn't make the natives of India non-native. All right? Think logically and always try to trace back the origin of any term. Okay, Showcase says, what do you think about China claiming Agnify's distance to be more? Is it to weaken the West's trust over India? Who cares whether the West trusts India or not? We don't need anyone's trust. 
So the Chinese, uh, I'm not sure what they've claimed. Look, I'll, I'll tell you about the Agni 5. The government of India, whether it is DRDO or whoever else, have never put out a number and said that this is the range that the Agni 5 missile has. We have never officially put out a range, an official figure of the range of the missile. So it is speculated that this missile has a range between five and 10,000 kilometers. Okay. And recently we did a test and it had the, the NOTAM, the notice to airmen was that they, we had created this exclusion zone on so-and-so date where nobody must go because if you go there, you may be hit by something. And that range was not a very long range. But before that, a few months ago, we had a range that went all the way almost to Australia. That was possibly a different missile, perhaps. Okay? Nobody has gone and seen which missile was tested. But yeah. So we have we have maintained ambiguity about the range of the missile. And if somebody says it's a 5,000 ra kilometer range missile or somebody says 8,000 kilometer range missile, they are speculating. Only our scientists and our government knows what the actual range is. And we have been developing missiles for decades. We, we have some of the best, best missiles in the world. There is nothing that prevents our scientists, our engineers from developing a missile of any arbitrary range. 5,000 kilometers? Sure, why not? 10,000? We can do it. 15,000? Yeah, we can do it. Okay? So, uh, that's why the Chinese, <laughs> they have been, I don't know what they've been claiming. Apparently, they are saying it's a 10,000 kilometer range missile. Well, good. It better be. So, uh, so if you put the map on the screen, uh, if you were to launch a missile from, let's say, Odisha, okay? And let's just measure the distance from Odisha to, let's say, uh, Sapporo in Japan. It's about 5,000 kilometers. Is nothing, you see, is nothing. Is is very less. It's, let's say the range distance from Mumbai, for example, to, let's say, Beijing. It's 4.7 thousand kilometers. So even if the Agni missile has a range of 5,000 kilometers, we essentially cover the whole of China in that. Let's see the distance from Gujarat to let's say uh, um, let's say London. It's seven thousand kilometers. So if the Agni five has an eight thousand kilometer range, then it can cover the whole of Europe. So, yeah. So the Chinese are claiming this. <laughs> Why would they claim this? They probably want to make it look like it's not aimed for China, but it's aimed for the West, possibly. But you know what? People are not kids, especially in the world of international relations and geopolitics. The whole world understands who India's number one adversary is, who India's number one threat is. And that is not Pakistan, it is China. And any long-range missile would be developed with China in mind. So yeah, they will make all kinds of claims and all that, which they should. They, we have to play the game, right? But it's essentially developed with China in mind. If as long as it's a you know six seven eight thousand kilometer range, obviously it should also have other countries in its in its umbrella. Why not? Because why not? So yeah. Okay, the UK research group predicts the second India-China war will occur between twenty twenty five and twenty thirty. What's my perspective? Do I do I think it's feasible? So India and China first went to war for the first time in their history in nineteen sixty two. That was the first war. The second was a limited war, 1967. India lost the 62 war. India won the 67 war. And there was a significant clash in the late 80s also. I think it was in 87. So if you take 67 and 87 to be limited wars, like Kargil, Kargil was a limited war as we know, then India and China have gone to war thrice. But let's say, okay, that, that's all part of history, fine. So some research group in the UK has apparently predicted that the second India-China war will occur between 2025 and 2030. What's my perspective? Uh, well, it, it all depends on various factors. Do I think it will happen? I think it is actually... It's, it's not unlikely, entirely unlikely, but it would be foolhardy for any nation, any of the two nations, either India or China, to go to war with the other. Because, because what do you achieve? You're going to achieve nothing. Look, 
the terrain the terrain between that that demarcates the india tibet border which is the current india china border is extremely inhospitable extremely mountainous the highest mountainous range in the world extremely high altitudes you go there and you, you're going to have trouble breathing just standing you if somebody asks you to run it's going to be next to impossible for you to run for more than 5 minutes okay that's how high the altitude is that's how low the amount of oxygen in the, uh, in the air is over here so it's almost impossible it is it is definitely impossible to have tank warfare to have uh, uh you know mechanized charges all that and when it comes to fighter planes and all that tibet is at such a high altitude that fighter planes have to take off with a lower payload let's say you have a fighter plane that has a payload of let's say 5000 kg just hypothetically well the amount of payload you can take off with depends on your altitude because your fuel needs to combust with oxygen to produce thrust okay in the jet engine if you're taking off from sea level you have extremely dense saturation of oxygen in the atmosphere in the air which means the your jet engine will perform at the highest if you're taking off from, from sea level but if you're taking off from let's say 5000 1000 kilometers above sea level you're going to have a, a lot less oxygen in the air which means your fighter plane will not be able to take off with a payload of 5000 kilograms of weapons but maybe only 2000 kilograms of weapons which is a huge problem when it comes to india our airfields are south of the himalayas so we can take off from much lower altitudes which means our fighter planes can take off with much heavier payloads when it comes to china their fighter planes can take off with lower payloads lighter payloads and all their positions are exposed because there is no forest cover up there and then whatever fighting will happen it will have to be man to man fighting because of the extremely inhospitable terrain and then please let's not forget that both nations have nuclear weapons and uh, god forbid if certain red lines are crossed you you don't want a nuclear exchange so you may be china that's that's the second largest economy in the world and you've spent so many decades building up this economy and you make one stupid mistake and you lose everything so do you want to be in that situation if you are china in that position if you china so because of all these things i think it's unlikely that the two nations will have any significant clash of course i could be wrong if some idiot somewhere makes a stupid choice then who knows what could happen so i don't think there's any idiot in power either in india or china definitely not mr xi jinping is not a crazy person mr modi obviously we know he is a very very capable leader so is mr xi jinping actually so i don't think any stupid thing will happen unless some crazy military commander does something stupid so i think that if a war does happen which it may it could be a localized limited war going beyond a localized war would be extremely dangerous for both nations so yeah that's how i see it all right what else do we have mm. ram panjwani says can india and china relations improve in the future india and china's relations can improve in the future only when first of all india rises to a to a to an amount of hard power that is comparable to that of china and secondly when the tibet issue is resolved as long as india and china two massively powerful nations and massively large nations have a common border there is always going to be the adversarial relationship you simply cannot have a good relationship when two powerful and large nations share a common border okay so for india and china to be peace have a peaceful relationship again like we have always had we need tibet to be independent again and that obviously will take time so in the future what's the earliest that tibet could be free maybe 2050 or something like that i don't know it depends on so many different factors that you cannot you know make a prediction there are some people who love making predictions i don't so i'm i'm saying maybe by 2050 you may have a change so if tibet becomes independent again then india and china could have good relations you know one of the major factors that that kind of uh, is is con that contributes to reasonably okay relations between russia and china 
is the fact that Mongolia exists as a large buffer state. Of course, half of Mongolia has been taken over by China. It's called Inner Mongolia, which has been occupied and annexed by China, just the way, same way they have taken Tibet. But this large nation, Mongolia, which is mostly empty, which is a very small pop population, it acts as a buffer between Russia and China, which is why the the kind of border that Russia and China have is, is much smaller than what, what it otherwise would have been. And that contributes to some kind of stability between the, in the relations between the two nations. If this entire border was just Russia and China, the two nations would not be able to live in peace together. So what we need is Tibet to be free again. In that case, India and China's relations could will definitely improve in the future. Okay. Okay, so Refreshing Spot says in today's multipolar world, is India getting closer to Russia-China side? No. India is playing its own role in geopolitics. India is essentially playing the role of a bridge between uh, the global south and the western nations. The western nations are the nations that are led by the US, controlled by the US, which is the nations of the EU, of NATO, and uh, all the other nations in, in the Americas, all that. Um, so that's the West. The global South is the other nations, the nations of Africa and uh, the nations of Asia, etc. So India is kind of a bridge between these two. And, uh, you know, even Russia is nowadays considered to be an Asian nation because the West doesn't want to consider Russia to be a Western nation. So India is playing its own game. Okay, India doesn't want to take sides. India wants to have good relations with everybody. India wants to trade with everybody. We want uh, we want Russian, Russian oil, we want uh, Western technology, and we will pay for it, obviously. We're not stealing anything. So that's the kind of constructive role India wants to play. And India obviously aspires to rise again, become a major power by 2047, 2050, which we should. So, so we're not taking sides. We want to be in good in, on good terms with everybody. So India is not getting closer to the Russia-China side. China, it's, there's no chance of India getting closer to China. Because the Chinese are so belligerent and we have this huge border dispute and the Chinese refuse to demarcate the border. And this actually plays into Russia's hands because Russia is also afraid of getting too close to China and becoming too dependent on China. So there's this weird triangle, triangular game happening between India, Russia, China, where the rise of India, is, is actu it actually makes Russia's life easier because it puts pressure on China. So that's the deal. Uh, that's how it is. All right, what else do we have? Okay, Karthik says, I sometimes fail to understand why India underestimates Ma Mongolia. I mean, don't you think we must develop significant relationships with Mongolia so that we can have more military bases on the land? Um, let's take a look at Mongolia. What's the population of Mongolia? Let me check the population of Mongolia. What's the population of Mongolia? 33 lakhs, which is 3.3 million. I am pretty sure that most cities in India will be larger than this. Okay? So the population is insignificant. The land area is, is big. But Mongolia is a nation that doesn't have any real power. It doesn't have a significant military. It has no significant economy. It is trapped between two giant powers. It's essentially, it only serves one purpose, that of a buffer state between Russia and China. And that's the only reason why it has been allowed to remain independent. Otherwise, the Chinese or the, or the Russians would have gobbled it up long ago. Okay, yes, Mongolia used to be very powerful during the time of Shri Chinggis Khan. Those days are long gone. Those days are long gone. It's a, I, 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 I am very fond of Mongolia. I would love to see Mongolia rise again and, and become prosperous again. But today, it is not in that sort of situation. It is a big territory. But there is nothing to underestimate or overestimate over here. You have to be realistic as to understanding each nation's position in the global world order. And Mongolia is today a nation that is, to be very realistic, a nation that doesn't have much power, doesn't have a significant economy, doesn't have significant population. The only 
plus point, the only thing that is in the favor is that they are independent still and they have a large amount of territory. That's all. And you can't simply have military bases in Mongolia. The Chinese won't allow that. The Russians won't allow that. How do you resupply those bases? Think logically. Think logically. You have to supply military bases. You have to have lines of communication. Look at the map. To, to supply your, your hypothetical military bases in Mongolia, you would have to fly over China. You think China will uh, allow those overflights? Think logically. Even the Russians won't allow that. They, they, they consider Mongolia to be part of their zone of influence. If you, if you know history, you will know why. So you have to be realistic in uh, when, it, when you think about these things. We, we're not playing children's games here. There are so many factors that you have to consider. And it is simply unsustainable, unfeasible, unfeasible to, to have Indian military bases in Mongolia. All right. What else? Um, okay, Jay says, Bonjour, Abhijit. Je suis originaire du Québec et je conf conforme tes, tes dires sur la vérité à propos de notre société ici. Présentement, il y a ce grand débat à propos des transsexuels. Oui, oui. So, my friend Jay is saying that uh, he's from Quebec and he confirms what I'm saying about the truth of uh, the society over there in Quebec, in Canada. Right now, there's this big debate about uh, transsexuals and all that. So that is the big, big uh, struggle, societal struggle that the West is facing. Transsexuals and, and LGBTQ and all that. These are the big challenges and the big uh, quest for justice in the West. <laughs> you have to uplift the people. You know, you cannot take these uh, fringe things and make them mainstream. Of course, you can do whatever you want. But... Uh, yeah, so so what Jay is essentially saying is that there is this big debate right now in Canada, in Quebec, about the transsexuals. And Mr. Monsieur Justin Trudeau is one of the biggest champions of this. You know, the, the, the rainbow flag. I, look, I have nothing against anybody of any sexuality. Who cares? Who cares what someone's sexuality is? What, what matters is what you do with your life, what you contribute to, this, to society. That's what matters. Who cares what you do in the privacy of your house? Nobody cares. But that's what they want to, to make the whole world about today. You know, the, the woke uh, rulers, of, rulers of the West. So, you know, and, and that's what's taught in schools to children. They taught about, I don't know, gay sex or whatever. I don't, that's what I hear. Which is terrible. Children should be taught, should be given the tools that equip them to succeed in life. And what success in life? It's it, it's to rise to the fullest of extent of your potential. Everybody has a certain amount of potential in them. Everybody has some talents. And the purpose of life is, is to contribute to society. That's my opinion. You may disagree with that. If you... If the, when the time comes to depart from this world on your last day, if you look back at your life and you find that you have given more to society than you've taken from, from society, then I think you had a good, you lived a good life. That's how I see. That's how I see things. So that's what you should equip people to do to succeed at that in contributing something good to society, contributing genuine value to society. Who cares what your sexuality is or what your gender is or what your gender range is? So. What is essentially being done to Western society is they are destroying Western society. They are tearing down the the the, the moral fabric of society. They are they are not inculcating children and young people with any, you know, any set of values or any any set of standards. It's it's, it's about lowering the standards of society. That's what's happening. It's 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 so unfortunate. I mean, you know, yeah. I would like to see everyone happy, but all over the world, white, black, green, pink, North American, European, Asian, African, everybody. But yeah, that's just the way it is right now. <clears throat> okay. Subramaniam Jai Shankar. Namaste, sir. <laughs> Saying in a war or conflict, will Russia support India or Pakistan hypothetically? Russia in a hypothetical war between India and Pakistan will say that Will will be neutral. Russia will be neutral. Russia will Russia obviously knows who's gonna win, 
so they will not antagonize india by by doing anything stupid or saying anything stupid but they will give out the general statement that please stop fighting please resolve your disputes through negotiations all the standard diplomatic talk that anybody would do i mean if if uh, when when russia and you, the ukraine thing happened india said the same things that this is not a time for war please uh, go to the negotiating table and resolve your differences through negotiations that's the standard statement that any responsible nation would make so if india and pakistan go to war russia will say same thing of course after half an hour there will be no need to say the same thing because the war will be will be over but there you have it there you have it i'm being realistic here um <laughs> cricket tug of nations do you think dropping virat kohli in t20 world cup will do any good to india bcci says they need power pack players i think virat kohli will do best in pressure situations you know you have to keep changing you have to keep evolving when the australians dropped steve war there was this big outcry but the team kept on doing well they dropped dean jones in the late 80s for no reason when he was at the peak of his form at the, at the peak of, you know in the, in the prime of his of his career and they just dropped him and they never took him again but they kept doing well you have to be ruthless you have to be ruthless i'm not saying uh, that uh, kohli should be dropped i'm not opining any such thing but in case it is that's what they do i think they probably know what they're doing i'm sure kohli is, is is at a certain age where it may be time to start thinking about a post cricket life possibly he is not the youngest guy anymore i'm sure he must be in his 30s um you know 35 is old for a sports person unless you are jimmy anderson who is in his who is, must be like 58 years old by now jimmy anderson the swing bowler english english swing bowler must be at least 58 by now but uh, typically 35 is kind of when you would want to move on I'm not sure how old 35 36 37 the great man ashwin is still going strong he must be 35 or 36 and so on uh so when it comes to t20 you need to be really fit you need to be really strong virat isn't the biggest and strongest guy I and mean, he's very fit obviously we know one of the fittest guys around so i think you know we are a nation of 1.4 billion people there is so much talent you think there are not 700 people who are more talented than kohli out there of course there are so it's about the nation first the cause first we want to win we don't want a repeat of the of the world cup the 50 over world cup in which certain you know what happened yeah we did extremely well until the final so yeah so i think it's okay if they decide to drop kohli i mean they've they've dropped ashwin so many times that guy would have had 600 test wickets by now if he had not been dropped so many times he's is probably the best uh, spinner in the world right now and they keep dropping him so if they can drop ashwin then the same thing the same kind of thing could happen to kohli as well i have nothing against it i am always in in favor of rapid change and always get the best young people in always get the best young people in i'm sure there are people who have served the nation for so many years and they've made so many runs and all but you know what when there are younger people fitter people stronger people out there hungrier people out there who don't earn millions of dollars a year but who want to do that give them a chance so that's how i see it my friends <clears throat> gaming lover says why is indian style architecture traditional architecture not reflected in new modern buildings government government buildings etc in india i mean go to japan they prioritize their architecture they showcase their architecture government buildings are built with japanese style architecture go to china you will see chinese style architecture go to go to uh, nations in the in the in the in middle east the arabian peninsula etc you will see government buildings etc built using arabic style architecture and so on but india has the ugliest government buildings in the world which have no style whatsoever just rectangles and boxes it's because our <laughs> because there is no sense of pride the you know what there are lots of really good bureaucrats in, in india today young hungry bureaucrats who want to serve the nation okay so of late i am seeing really really good people come in and i am sure in you know there are many senior bureaucrats also who are really good but i would say if you take the average bureaucrat okay that person is typically deracinated they go through the upsc syllabus which totally exposes them to all the wrong ideas anti india hindu phobic ideas so they 
you you study that for two three years to pass the UPSC exam, you're gonna be crammed. Your brain is gonna be crammed full of all these thoughts, these notions that essentially terms India as an inferior culture. All this, whatever you study in history for UPSC, is the NCRT nonsense and all that. You know, the British were great reformers. They came to 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 uplift India from poverty, hmm? and the Mughals were the best thing that happened to India. And Indian culture is inferior. All that nonsense. You go through that for a few years, you're gonna have no pride in Indian culture, and you will want to, you know, uh, have buildings that are ugly and have nothing to do with Indian styles. Uh, and of course, there is the cost cutting that happens and skimming sometimes that allegedly happens. It is said. And so on. So obviously, you would have the you would want to have buildings that have no style at all, with the least amount of cost possible, and that's what you see. So that is why it is so. Once you bring in the sense of pride in identity and civilizational identity, then you will have different. You will see something else in India. Adi Bhav says UPSC has such syllabus. I I'll tell you something. Even a person who who is proud to be Indian, you make them study that syllabus for two or three years to pass the exam, they'll become leftists. They, they'll start hating India. They'll start, you know, having strong doubts about Indian culture. They'll start believing that we used to burn our women alive. That sati used to happen in every every corner of every city and every village. They'll 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 believe that we were the most um, in egalitarian, misogynistic, patriarchal, oppressive society in human history. You go through that syllabus and you study that, you know, cram that over and over again. You do that for one or two years, you're gonna be, you know, gonna emerge a completely different person. So, yes, that is the case. That is the case. Piyush Tiwari says, Is Modi a good PM? Because somebody always allegates him. Listen, why do you care about people's opinions about what X person or Y person says about Prime Minister Modi? Why don't you see where India was in 2014 when Mr. Modi became Prime Minister? And where do you see where India is today? How do you quantify the change? Look at where India's GDP is. Look at the number of airports India has. Look at how much rail railways have or have not been built. Look at how many highways have or have not been built. Look at how many people have been brought into the banking system. How many people have bank accounts. Look at how many people, you know, how many new gas connections have, have been given, how many new water connections have been given. Look at the infrastructure that's been, that's been built and look at how it was in the 10 years before Mr. Modi came to power so that you can compare this 10-year period with this 10-year period. And then you can see for yourself what, what the truth is. How do you care what someone says? I just don't understand why you need to look into people's opinions. Don't listen to anyone's opinions, including mine. Look at what cannot be denied. Numbers. But obviously it takes some work to do it and people are lazy. No, 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 I don't want have the time. I don't know where to look. It is too difficult to do the research myself. It will take you five minutes, but you will not do it. Please raise your standards. Learn how to seek out the truth so that you don't have to depend on anyone's opinion. I also have opinions. So, so and so YouTuber also will have opinions. Everybody has an opinion just like everybody has a nose. So you need to stay out of everybody's nose. And you need to look at the actual hard number statistics data. Learn how to seek this out. It's all available for free on the internet. Then you will not have to ask me <laughs> or YouTuber X or YouTuber Y as to what the truth is. Because you will see the truth for yourself. So that's my message to all of you. All of you. Please learn how to do research on the internet. And learn how to differentiate facts from opinions. Facts are just numbers. Just numbers. A number is a number. An opinion is a story. Do you understand the difference between a story and a number or a set of numbers? Always rely on hard data. Numbers cannot be falsified. You cannot imagine numbers or invent numbers. Numbers are reported numbers, right? So that's what I would say to you. I don't care what so and so YouTuber says or doesn't say about the prime minister. Okay, the the track record of the prime minister speaks for itself. In my opinion, he's the best prime minister we've had since 1947. And now some people will say I'm a bhakt or this or that. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference to me. 
doesn't make any difference to me whatsoever. Anyway, so that's how I see it. Please verify that for yourself, sir. Um, Jeel Chandarana says, I am fully connected to my dharma, but I had to give UPSC because of my parents' wishes. Yeah, well, that's life, you know. You gotta please people, you gotta please parents, you gotta please family, you you have all these uh, requirements that are all, you know, you have to fulfill as as a as a member of a family, as a member of society. Sometimes you have to put other people's wishes in front of yours, ahead of yours. Uh and sometimes you should know what is best for you. And sometimes you have to look at the end of the day. Nobody will remember what sacrifices you made to make one or two people happy. At the end of the day, you will be you will be judged based on based on what you contributed to society. Now, let's say you could have been a great entrepreneur, but you, you know, just to make someone happy. Let's say your your mom or your dad happy. You did UPSC, you became a bureaucrat, and you spend your entire life carrying out people's orders. Did you contribute to society the way you could have contributed as a great entrepreneur? Maybe you did not. Probably you did not. So at the end of the day, you know, what really matters is what you do in your life and what you give back to the world. And sometimes you may have to displease people, but as long as you do it for the right cause, for the right reasons, then I think it would be justified, you know. Uh, so yeah, so you are saying that you are fully connected to your dharma, but you have to give UPSC. You have to go through the UPSC, you know, study process and take the exams. Sit for the exam. Well, I, then I am pretty sure you know what I mean when I say that you know that syllabus will make you doubt your own culture, your own your own history, and all that. So I hope uh, you went through. You know, we're not too too badly affected by that. Ah, uh, my history teacher keeps telling us that we Indians were tribals, primitive ragtag tribals. And the British came and modernized us and uplifted us. But when I argued her on this fact, on this fact, I was insulted in front of the class. But why? I'll tell you why. Because your teacher is a goddamn idiot. She's a moron. That's why. I'll tell you what. Please understand something. See, you know, you know, we Indians, we are taught that our teachers are our gurus, and we must always have the utmost respect for them. Do you? So, so to that, I would say this. Do you know the true meaning of the of, of the term guru? A guru is not someone who will charge you a fee every month. And a guru will not stop teaching you if you are no longer able to pay that fee. A guru is your teacher for life. Okay? And a guru will not give you will, will not say that if you pay me six months at a, at a single go, I will give you a 30% discount. So a teacher is not a guru. A teacher is a service provider. A teacher doesn't care about you. A teacher has hundreds of students and you just a number for that for that person. Okay. So stop putting teachers on a pedestal. Some teachers, a very few of them, are genuine gems. And if you have such a, such a teacher, you are one of the luckiest people in the world. A genuinely good teacher. But most teachers are mediocre. Most teachers have no knowledge whatsoever. They will simply take what's in the textbook and regurgitate you. And they hate students asking questions and when a student asks questions that student is labeled as a troublemaker and then they, they will insult you because they have this position of power so my advice to those of you who are in school and college and all that is this there's no need to argue with idiots okay whatever knowledge you can gain if any at all from your, these so-called teachers you gain it i personally have gained no knowledge ever in classrooms whatever knowledge i have gained in my life is through my own self study outside of classrooms classrooms are a waste of time you you learn nothing just like podcasts essentially you learn nothing you may get ideas and you may get direction from podcasts but you will get no real knowledge unless you sit down and study and read from a book you will get some tidbits of knowledge from podcasts and you may get inspiration from podcasts to study but the real knowledge comes from self study only from sitting down alone with a book and spending a few hours reading so my point is don't argue with idiots many teachers are idiots some teachers are genuinely good people if you have such a teacher you are lucky you should cherish that teacher teacher but most of them are idiots 
I say this from personal experience, most. But I've had, I've been lucky enough to have one or two good teachers, you know. But most of them are oh, abysmally poor in terms of standards. So don't argue with idiots. That's all I'll say. All right, let's take one more question. Two hours, 10 minutes, long, long time we've done this. Uh, let's take one more question. Let's take one more question. Um, 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 there's so many questions. What shall I take? Um, uh, let us see. Okay. Okay, let's, we didn't talk about Russia-Ukraine today, did we? Okay, Atharva says, what's the current situation of Russia-Ukraine war? And what will be the next step of Putin as he will, as it is, be a selected president of Russia? Okay, so we have the Russian presidential elections this year. I wonder who will win. Will Mr. Putin win? I assure you he will win, as he should. Uh, so look, Mr. Putin is going to win the elections. We know that. Okay, I'm not making fun of the system over there or the process over there or of Mr. Putin. He is the right leader for Russia right now. And he should keep on ruling from the Russian national interest perspective. So he's going to win the elections. We know that. <clears throat> so what's the next step? Look, this is a long process. This war is just the beginning of a complete reconfiguration of the global geopolitical world order. And eventually, the way I see it, look, Ukraine essentially has been destroyed. They have thrown all of their young men into the jaws of war, the horrible... The term they use is the meat grinder. The young men are gone. Now they're throwing old men into the meat grinder and pregnant women also. Pregnant women are fighting the battle battles now. So Ukraine has been finished as a, as a nation, as a society. Okay, And at some point in time, Russia will decide what happens with, with Ukraine. So most likely Ukraine will be partitioned. Some part of it could go to Poland. And a lot of it could go to Russia. And some part of it could remain as a rump state. That's how I see it. So, uh, and the West has failed in defeating Russia or, or harming Russia. The sanctions have backfired. They have done more harm to Europe than to Russia. So that's the situation right now. And uh, time will tell how long this war will last. Maybe it will be over in the next six months. Maybe it will last another three years, five years. Who knows? But it's the, it's, it's the beginning of a larger conflict. The total reconfiguration of the geopolitical world order and the era of multipolarity that we are in right now. Right, so that's that's how I see it right now. All right, uh, ladies, gentlemen, everybody, am I excited for the Mike Tyson fight? Yes, I am. I would like to see Mike, Iron Mike fight again. He's going to fight one of the pool brothers. Is it Jake or with the other one, whoever it is? But yeah, I would love to see him fight one more time. With left hook in the, the peekaboo style. Love it. Yeah, so let's see that. All right, everybody, thank you so much for all the questions. I apologize to those of you whose questions I have not been able to take. Obviously, there have been so many questions and I've only been able to take a few, but I'm going to make this um, a more regular thing now. Of, of late, I have done very few Ask Abhijit episodes, but I'm going to make it much more regular now. So I look forward to seeing you next Saturday, same time, same channel, and I'll take many more of your questions at that time. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care and keep raising your standards. Until next time. Bye-bye.